We'll give you a warning in 10 minutes. Let's see. 10 for you. Okay. You can tell me this. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'll, start, I'll start first by apologizing for two or three people in this audience who have heard a version of this talk, basically this talk in Diaz in Dublin. Okay? Uh, we do have, we did not get stopped. There. We have new results, but I thought that this will be simpler to present to an audience who is not familiar with this topic. Okay? So uh, for these two, two or three people, it is a bit of a repetition, but so in passing, I'll mention some new things which we have got. Okay, let us see what happens. Okay. So let me start by uh, saying that if one considers any physical theory whatsoever, is be it classical, be it quantum, there are two aspects to the theory. First is the set of observables which you are going to look at. In quantum theory, it is usually assumed to be uh, 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 observables which form a C star algebra, a, 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 a non-commutative non C star algebra, whereas in classical theory, it is a commutative, uh, presumably commutative algebra, say, let us say, bounded function. Okay? Uh, this is what you are going to do experimentally, measure experimentally. Then on these things, you have quant uh, states. So states are uh, positive linear functionals. They are probability measures, prob which are pro uh, positive linear functionals on this algebra, which on the identity of, the, of this algebra, they give you the value one. So the total probability is one. Okay? This is the case also, be it classical or be it quantum, this is the case. Okay? Now, in classical theory, it so happens that the algebra is commutative. And, and because it is commutative, if it is sufficiently smooth, there is a very important theorem due to Gelfand and Neimark, which somehow is stimulated by physics, and which says that if you have a commutative algebra and you look at the family with irreducible representations uh, under favorable conditions, it will reproduce, well, technically a, a house of topological space, and under further conditions, it will actually uh, produce uh, along with the topology of that space. So, so the commutative algebra will produce also the topology. Of, a, a, of the spectrum of the space, which is a set of irreducible representations, and under favorable conditions, it will also produce a manifold. Okay? The last result has been proved only recently by a group of, well, basically by rather remarkable papers by Alain Kuhn. Okay? It took many years to complete the proof to get the manifold, but he now has a proof. Okay? And along with Batilde Marcoli, they have a massive book. If you look at the non commutative case, the story is very different. Okay? What happens in the non commutative case is you have a non commutative algebra and states on it as before, but the nature of the states on this algebra are very different. Okay? They, in my opinion, the, bit, the basic difference between commutative and non commutative, quantum and classical, is that in one case, algebra is non commutative, in the other case, it is commutative. Okay? This is, I think, the basic mathematical difference, also the phys physical difference. We, when we do quantum mechanics, we do not see space time. Okay? We see only an algebra and stays on it. Then we infer the properties of the manifold because of our practice. We write x and say these are, co these are coordinates of a spatial slice, but we don't know that. It's just, they are just family of functions okay? fulfilling some algebraic relations. And when, and by expectation values, we have to infer the existence of, of a manifold underlying it, and which we do automatically by instinct, but not in a logical way. Okay? So whenever one tries to deal with uh, quantum physics, one has to take into account this difference. And in this talk, I will uh, illustrate to you one striking difference between the two cases uh, that happens in quantum theory. And I am going to talk now about the theta vacuum. Okay? So uh, uh, the reason I picked the theta vacuum is uh, some phenomenon happens, which uh, is somewhat very surprising if you're not familiar with this kind of situation. 
And that is the fact that uh, purely from gluon states, you produce a spin half uh, representation of the Pongre group. Okay? The spin half representation, let us say, of the rotation group. Okay? Uh, you don't expect it. You have only gluons in the quantum theory, but you, nevertheless, you produce a spin half states from this quantum theory. So I want to tell you how this happens and some more surprising results of this theta vacuum. In particular, I will say, show you how the theta vacuum you, we write down is highly degenerated. There are many uh, theta states you can write down with exactly the correct winding number. So the quantum state describing the physics of uh, the axion, for example, is we don't know which one it is. There are uncountably many of them and you have to make a mixture of them and the mixture will give different results for the expectation values for various properties of the eta prime. For example, uh, the electric dipole moment of the neutron, they will all give different results. Okay? And we don't know, I don't know which one is how to do this calculation in an appropriate way. But I can tell you enough that some of you may be uh, clever enough to figure out how to make a calculation. So this by way of introduction. So let me remind you of the gate group in the case of, uh, uh, in the case of SUN. Here, the canonical way you find in textbooks is that the gate group is a group of maps from the three sphere to SUN. Three sphere is coming because the particular gauge transformations you consider become identity at infinity. So you have a compactification of R3 into S3, and you have these maps, uh, which, is, which I denote by script G. And for these maps, there are winding number transformations, G to the N with winding number N, because of the fact that the third homotopy group of SUN is the set of integers. Okay? So this is a well-known result. And if UG is operator, which uh, for winding number one, okay, what happened? How do I go back? I want to go back to the beginning. How do I do it? I touched something and it went away. You can only go forward. It's forward and back. There's two arrows. You see? I see. Now you go back. Okay. Okay. So, because of the fact that the third homotopy group of SUN is the set of integers. Okay? So, so, what do we mean by this statement? In quantum theory, it is no use, or in classical theory, it is no use to tell this by words. You have to show the appropriate operators and the quantum states on which they are operating. Without the two things, then applying the one on the other, you don't get experimentally measurable numbers. So, what do I mean by saying that the uh, this these sectors exist in in SUN gauge theories is that there is an operator called UG okay, with winding number one. G has winding number one, and there is an operator called UG, and this has the property hmm, UG, and it has a property that there is something called the theta state exponential i theta. When I apply UG on this, I get the eigenvalue exponential i theta. Okay, this is what we mean by saying that I am looking at uh, winding number, th uh, winding number ex uh, theta state, actually exponential i theta state, and then you can apply local operators on this state, and you get a whole family or a whole uh, ladder of states, which are called, the, and their com linear combinations, which is usually called the folium of this particular topological sector. Okay? But there are two questions which remain. Uh, very often in the literature, you stop here, okay? You stop here, then people start writing functional degrees. Okay? I think it's a bad habit, but that's what they start doing. Okay? Because you don't know, uh, two questions which remain is, what is this exponential i theta? We have to write it in terms of, say, Fox space in, on which I can act with operators. And I should tell you what this operator UG is okay? explicitly. The first is easy to uh, solve, okay? because uh, you can already guess it from the instant dot physics, uh, and it is simply given by 
they say the Fock vacuum, zero is a Fock vacuum I'm writing, zero is a Fock vacuum I'm writing, and applying the uh, uh, turns a, a twist state by exponential i theta times this turns i minus t k k a, and I where k a is defined by this equation here. So I define this exponential i theta by this equation. Okay. I have to show that this is correct, that it transforms under winding number in the correct way. So let me do this calculation by hand by saying that the gauge transform of A is G D G inverse, where G is the gauge transformation and D is the covariant derivative. So K, so one knows by generic well, very well known arguments, then the integral here, d cubed x of this turn Simon's term transformed by A is the original one plus this extra term. This extra term depends only on G and this integral for winding number one is exactly the winding, winding number of G. So whatever this last expression is the winding number of G. Okay? So if G goes to one at infinity and it is a sufficiently smooth function on space, spacious slice, this integral is independent of the choice of, is independent of the choice of G and always gives N. Okay? So that's good. So one, one problem is solved Namely, this is the uh, this uh, 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 expression seems to be the correct uh, theta state to start from, on which you can build the whole folium of states by applying local operators on it. Okay? But what is the operator UG? Okay, said so that UG A UG inverse is G D G inverse. I have used it here. So what is this UG? Well, here there is some uh, here the uh, the full power of the Gauss law comes into the play. Okay. The Gauss law is a very important. Somebody said we will ignore Gauss law or uh, we will only use it. It may not matter and so on. But without the Gauss law, one cannot define even electric charge. Okay. So let alone super selection sectors. So we start with the Gauss law and write it in the usual way in the non abelian case. So E is electric field and non abelian electric field and this covariant derivative d acts on e in the usual way and j0 is the charge density of the matter system okay but this is not a, a good way for us to write because of the fact that this script d is acting on e and e is happens to be a distribution okay? a distribution valued operator so now we do handle this e very much like if some of you are familiar with say elliptic operators and then uh, distributional solutions of elliptic operators using Sobolev spaces. We write this as a after a part, we write this in a slightly different way by take, taking Lie algebra value test functions chi. Okay. So chi is a test function, ordinary function, which is Lie algebra value, which goes to zero at infinity and uh, say is compactly supported, any compactly supported function chi. And we write this equation here. There's no light. It's gone. Okay. The bulb is gone, I think. I ah, hear it. Is. Yeah. So we assume that is chi go, the test take any test function whatsoever, which is compactly supported, which goes to zero at infinity, and write this equation after a partial integration like this. So I replace this by this equation here. Okay. And acting on the vacuum, I say it is zero. Okay. So if you are in a classical domain. This is the same as this because you can do partial integration. But in general, because this E in quantum theory is an op, uh, distribution, one has to be a bit careful because the derivative of distributions is not properly defined without using integrating it with test functions. And J0 is the charge density. So, what do I do next? Yeah. One can easily uh, check, and I don't have to worry about it because the Calculation involves only local operators. So the Q of cascade written in the after the partial integration commuted with the connection field transforms it by a covariant derivative of chi, okay, as it should do. So this is the infinitesimal gauge transformation. So, but what is the particular transformation for theta vacuum as in y number one? Okay, that's what we want to find. No, A naught. Yeah, yeah. I am assuming, uh, yes, uh, yeah, yes, I can understand. Okay. 
I, I, I don't exactly know uh, how to treat A naught in this context. Okay? No, so, hmm? A not varying A A zero will A zero is a Lagrange multiplier in the field, and it will produce the Gauss law. Okay? So I'm focusing on the Gauss law. Now A zero is also a constraint in the Dirac theory. Okay? So how do I deal with that? Okay? But we will see later that it, the A zero is the source of the problem for indefinite metric and these crying spaces, which which should be uh, not uh, friendly to any of you. Okay? So I will see, but let me say that I have not thought through that problem in this context, but in a related problem, it has been solved, uh, solved it has been understood. Okay. okay. So, so, so I choose a test function, which I call H of X, which is Pauli matrix. So you choose some uh, in the n-dimensional vector representation of SUN, choose some say first two, uh, first two components and let tau be the generators Pauli matrices acting on the first two components. So these are the Lie algebra value tau, but write tau dot x hat times h of r, h hat of r. h hat of r is a function only of the radial variable. Okay? Now this uh, function should be well defined. I'm going to use this as my test function chi. So I choose h hat of r to vanish at the origin and at infinity to be pi. Okay? So, uh, uh, so at infinity, this h hat of r becomes pi, and at zero it vanishes because it vanishes at the origin. This the fact that x hat by itself is not differentiable at the origin does not matter because you can make h hat of r to vanish at the origin even in a, in an epsilon neighborhood of r, and there is no problem. Okay? So uh, this is a trick. This kind of thing has been chosen many many times in Skirmion physics. For example, Fedele, with Fedele, we have done many calculations like this. So I write uh, the Q of H as there should have been a small trace here, small traces with regard to the Lie algebra indices. And I write the Q of H, which is replacing this Q of chi by covariant derivative of H. This H is what I'm writing here, times EI, plus H of X times J0. Okay? So I'm replacing cascade here by this function. And writing Q of X. Now, does Q of X produce a winding number transformation? There are two properties of Q of X. I'll tell you both. The first transformation is let us see what happens to Q of X. Okay? So let psi be a colored field. Okay? So it could be a matter field. It need not have spin, but it should be a matter field. So I can compute the finite transformation on psi by conjugating it with exponential i Q H. So I look at this object and write this as the power series. And each term of the power series can be computed. Suppose the psi belongs to the issue as the basic representation of issue n, then each term is multiplied by tau dot x hat. So I get the series multiplying this as psi, and I get uh, which I can sum, and I get this expression. So the finite transformation on psi due to this exponential iq is this object here. Call this object as g of h. Now tau dot x hat squares to one. So one can actually calculate what it is, okay? and one see, see immediately that this G of H is the familiar scrim physics uh, transformation. So G of H is cosine of H hat plus I tau dot X hat sine of H hat, okay? where H hat at the origin is zero, as I told you, so sine vanishes, and H hat at infinity is pi. So again, the last term vanishes, but cos becomes minus one. So it goes from zero, one, G goes from one at the origin to minus one at the infinity. And this is the basic winding number one transformation in Skirmion physics. And that is what is happening here. So this G of H is winding number one. So the claim here is that the uh, finite transformation uh, corresponding to UG is exactly given by the Skirmion configuration, which we, with which we have worked for many years. Now, it so it, but notice the following fact. Okay. Okay. This G of H is a, does not, uh, the test function I have written down, one more page, it'll be right. Yeah. The test function I have written down does not vanish at infinity. Okay. So it is not a Gauss law transformation because that requires that the test functions vanish at infinity. So 
so i can do a partial integration so this is a one member or what people like stromger call large gauge transformations but these are objects which in fact sachin and i have considered many times in our papers and this there is no reason whatsoever why when you use test functions like this it should vanish under quantum states okay? the gauss law should vanish the generalized gauss law should vanish under quantum states okay? in fact charge operator requires this or this kind of construction okay? <coughs> to, to to even define it so this is my ufg so i have found the uh, 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 transformation corresponding to winding number 1 okay? and uh, the uh, such the set of such operators so this h i have chosen to be have a specific value at infinity namely tau dot x the at infinity the test function is tau dot x at so it is the configuration which comes for example if you consider non abelian monopoles so that's what i have chosen but you can have a more much more general choice where this h at infinity you simply get a generic function on the two sphere at infinity okay so they will but it should be smooth so that you can uh, uh, if it diverges then there are further problems so that group was introduced by us long ago with uh, sachin and i introduced it long ago uh, and discussed it a bit but it has come back again okay? uh, but it was actually inspired by uh, i should say here I, in the abstract i have written it this construction was inspired by <coughs> related work by abhay ashtaker and by anmanyon ashtaker long ago in the context of quantum gravity okay? so they were looking at this what they call spatial infinity group or spy group where again they were losing the character of the test functions to be able to represent the the the, uh, uh, the asymptotic symmetry group of quantum gravity on a spatial slice so they had introduced a spatial group a spy group and the language is bought uh, somewhat uh, borrowed from their work okay now however there is something very peculiar about uh, uh, this g okay or rather let's say uh, this q of h okay where is h i want to show you h again yeah because you notice that this h is very peculiar okay because if i make a spatial rotation not the spin rotation. so i am in, i am doing this in the uh, i don't care about spin half in the theory at all and if i take this turn sum as twisted uh, object where the connection form i have written down as an su2 valued connection form is up to me to choose it i choose it as an su2 valued connection form okay yeah. so this x here that i am writing down okay has this very peculiar property let's say for me an unexpected property that if i make a spatial rotation it changes because it doesn't ro rotate tau so if i make a spatial rotation at infinity this changes okay if i make a spa local spatial rotation this h is only changed by local terms and that will only produce a tr small gauge trans changes of small gauge transformations but if i start rotating x at at infinity so i make an angular orbital angular momentum rotation on x at this operator is changed okay if this operator is changed you are uh, uh, that operator is not uh, uh, observable because it is not uh, commuting uh, lo locality requires that uh, all observables commute to the gauss law as or small or large gauss law and it will not commute with it so it is not an observable okay so what happens is some of spatial rotation is broken but if i rotate tau also if i rotate both of them together <coughs> so i add uh, yeah uh, okay forget about this blob here i should have removed it but i forgot uh, so I, I add to this orbital angular momentum term acting on the uh, the tensor of the, on this connection uh, connection forms uh, a, a, a rigid rotation of QCD okay, uh, rotating the first two components 
So I add q tau i over 2. It is a rotation which depends only, which is what we would call a generator of SU2 in SUN. Okay? So I add the generator to Li and look at Ji. This Ji clearly will uh, commute with H. Okay? It will clearly commute with H because it will rotate both x at and tau. So this thing will not change. Well, this is a function of the radial variable. So that if I add this extra term okay, to Li, the J will commute with the uh, Gaussian, uh, this large gauge generator of the large gauge transformations. So this will, uh, I have to augment the orbital angular momentum by a global color rotation. In order that it commutes with this Gaussian generator this large gauge transformation generator in the quantum theory. So they can be implemented, this operator can be implemented in the theta sector, not the other one without the Q, because it will change the uh, theta sector into something else. I'll come, I'll come to what, it ha what happens in a minute. Okay. So but this phenomenon, by the way, so I have, I have added a spin half term. Uh, this term here, the extra term is a spin half term which I have added to orbital angular momentum. So if I look at the two pi rotation of Ji, you'll get minus one on this state, theta state. So the theta state purely in the gluon sector has acquired spin half. Okay. Spin half is, it has become spin -orial, Okay, I don't know if it's actually spin half, but it has become spin -orial, Okay, The two pi rotation changes its sign. Okay. But this phenomenon is not new. Okay. Uh, it is it, uh, in the context of particle physics, it goes back to the work of Hassin Frazen et al. And by uh, Jackie Van Ribby in the case of non abelian monopoles, where they also found a similar result. And much earlier, uh, Friedman and Sorkin were discussing uh, quantum geons. Okay? So the quantum geons they were considering are uh, uh, spacious. Uh, uh, so if you, you take a metric on a spacious slice, but the spatial slice is not R3 for them in those uh, papers, but they are R3 with, uh, let's say, uh, adding handles or uh, uh, other things on this spatial slice. So they are connected some of spatial slices with some uh, prime, what they call, what is what are called prime manifolds. And they show, showed in this very remarkable papers that took, uh, that when they define two pi rotation as a diffeomorphism on the spatial slice, that uh, the two pi rotation is not trivial on those on appropriate spatial slices, but can have minus one. Okay? So that paper is titled "Spin Half from Gravity." Okay? Um, it is not um, for some. Well, I think it is one of the most remarkable papers I have seen, okay? and maybe it will come back as we keep going. Okay? So we have borrowed this title from basically Friedman and Sorkin. Okay? I think this is a, a somewhat unexpected result because we have got spin half without spin half. Uh, there is no spin half field in the problem, but acting on the churn time is twisted back home, we get spin half. Okay? This phenomenon also occurs in fuzzy physics. Okay? When we add in fuzzy physics, instant run terms, in our book, which I wrote with Sachin and Sechkin, okay, uh, we already found projective modules which describe the instant on sectors very much like here. And we found that the, the appropriate projectors uh, creating the projective modules have the, again the property that they, may, they mix spin and isospin. So in our published book, it, this, this phenomenon is described. Okay. So already in finite dimensional matrix models, it can happen, provided you twist the matrix model by some project, project, uh, uh, tensor it with some other manifold and take a look at projective modules. Yeah. No, uh, 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 this is not quite right. I'll come back to this. Okay. You can find the full Lorentz group on this issue. Associated to adding Q to Y over 2, I can actually generate the full SL2C by adding to the standard boost the uh, Q I to Y over 2. So I take the pin half representation, half zero representation of SL2C and add this Q and call it Ki. And it will have the correct uh, algebraic relation with the ji which I wrote down. Okay? And what you will get is a Majorana representation. Unfortunately, this is not good. I'll tell you why. Okay? 
uh, okay so uh, but anyway uh, let me remark here already that i think but i don't know how to do the calculations that the axial phenomenology which is built on theta sectors will be affected by this new poincare transformation a new uh, rotation generators i have written down will affect the uh, axion model but let me see, give you what happened now zoom i don't want zoom okay how do I, okay. okay so but there is something wrong with this uh, operator i'm writing down with adding the boost also because if you go back to h which i wrote down earlier okay, and look at what happens if i uh, rotate this h so i'm rotating x side by rotation and tau by rotation all is fine but if i rotate tau by a boost it will change tau by a complex transformation in the Majorana representation and the and you have to know how to what to do with this xr because it will only transform uh, by some real representation of sl2c and uh, they i don't know of any way of finding an appropriate orbital counterpart so that this uh, full sl2c leaves this expression invariant so it seems that sl2c is broken okay? uh, namely sl2c the full sl2c also changes this topological sector this result is not new okay uh, not new in well this result is new but not the statement that there is some problem with Lorentz, with the Lorentz group okay? that is not new because uh, already in very old papers 30 40 years ago uh, uh, our friend uh, tom kibble has discussed infrared effects in qed and found many strange things happening including topological sectors some of them are mentioned in qed in hart's book mentions them and late, later as time progressed uh, 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 Frederick Morkio and Strocki wrote a very nice paper showing how the Poincare Lorentz generators cannot be implemented in the uh, cannot be implemented because of the infrared effects. So the uh, Lorentz group is explicitly broken, uh, spontaneously broken in QED. There is no Lorentz group uh, implementable as operators in QED. Okay? In fact, Hag already mentions it, but I'll show it to you if there is time that there are uncountably many such topological sectors where the Lorentz group cannot be implemented. This morning, there was some uh, question about Lorentz group. The moment you consider infrared effects, for example, black hole horizon, uh, and you have a massless field sitting around, namely QED, it will produce a lot of excitations on the boundary. And no way, there is no way, if you want to, to apply Lorentz transformation on them, it cannot be done. There is no such operator. Or if you take the say direct integral over the different Hilbert spaces by rotating, you will get a non-separable Hilbert space. Uh, again, this is known. Okay, uh, it goes back to the non-separability of these spaces. Again, goes back to I think uh, Hag mentions it, and many others mention it. So they are non-separable and they are bad. Okay, that is um, there are many top uh, conceptual issues which arise. When you deal, when you have to deal with non-separable Hilbert space. Okay? Now, let me go back to another phenomenon which is already ha happening here, which I realized, which only say a few weeks ago. Namely, when you write tau dot xl, okay, there is an identification of what is meant by SU two in the internal space and SU two SO three in the actual space. Okay, this identification is not unique. Okay? I can, for example, rotate tau by an issue to transformation without doing anything to exit and tau dot exit will still be good enough and the calculation about binding number only requires that the square of this operator is one okay that will be maintained if i choose a, a, a rotated tau it will be still okay but if i rotate tau i am rotating tau by this q tau i over two okay uh, just this global transformation i'm applying this uh, tau Okay. So I'm rotate. So I'm taking a new Q where I have rotated the Q by this global color transformation, and it will become a new Q. It is not the same as old Q. Okay. So the difference of the two Qs is not a Gauss law because the 
difference of two test functions don't vanish at infinity. One has a tau, the other has a tau prime. So the difference won't vanish. That is not a Gauss law. It will not vanish. So what has happened is that you have you are in a different topological sector, but the winding number is the same. The winding number only requires. Uh, the winding of this equation here, it gives you the winding number only requires from here to here is that this tau dot x set or the rotated tau dot x set squares to one. That is all it requires. Okay? Okay. That will be still maintained. So all of this has the same winding number. But what is happening is that the uh, the Gauss the, uh, the large gauge transformation generator has changed. Okay? So there are uh, for every such rotation of tau, you get a new. Uh, Q, which has the same weighted number. Okay. The reason is that the, uh, the map from the boundary group to boundary Lie algebra to the boundary group is not injective. There are many, many uh, boundary Lie algebra elements which map to the same element, same uh, finite transformation. So all these have the same weighted number. That means that this theta, which I wrote down at the beginning, there are many, many, the theta state I wrote down at the beginning. Yeah. Is not one. It is, it is a continuous infinity of this theta state. So I can do the following another thing. I can go back. Instead of rotating the thing at infinity, I can go back to this this uh, time term. And A is Lie algebra valued and is A alpha times uh, lambda alpha, where lambda alpha the generator is to n. And I can apply this Q tau i over 2. Okay. That will change this Q, K A. This this equation will no longer this equation will be okay but the g you get will not be the original g but a rotated g okay? so why uh, number is okay but it will change so this uh, under a uh, trans transformation of this kind this k this integral changes okay? so if you, there's another way of saying that the large gauge this large gauge transformation q tau over two changes the turn system okay? So there are infinitely, infinitely many such churn time terms. So first question that comes to mind is, and I think this is could be phenomenologically important. What is the theta state that is appropriate for the axion? Okay. As I said, I can take one theta state and rotate it by this uh, internal SU2 rotations or whatever, SUN or let's say SU2 rotations, smear them with test functions. And produce a mixed state. It will be a mixed state, but it will be mixed, but it will have the same winding number. Okay. So, so, which winding number theta state are you looking at? And is expect, the expectation values of observables in this rotated state will be also changed. So, what is it that you are looking at? Okay. I don't know. I think it will definitely affect things like the electric dipole moment. And um, a decent way of calculating the change would be very nice. Or if you are fond of functional integrals, which mm, which I think is uh, we should get out of the habit of writing these formal objects, okay, which are not very meaningful. But if you keep writing like that, that means that the functional integral has to be smeared. When you write the functional integral, you have to multiply it by test functions and integrate that also. Okay, test functions of theta, uh, uh, test functions of the rotated objects. So there will be some issue to element which rotates this winding number. This, the instant on term, and you have to put it there and you have to integrate. So there will be an additional integration in functional integration, and, uh, and the correlation function will change. How does it change? Okay. I have not done the calculation because I don't see uh, a neat way of doing it. So uh, I have not uh, uh, pursued it, but maybe one of you have ideas. Okay. So, uh, five minutes, I'll finish. I just make a few last remarks. Yeah. I, I just want to ask you, ask the question. You may ask, what are the states that excite them? Okay. So, let me look, I can give them to you, but I'm passing, I will show you the related issue of what happens in the abelian case of QED and why is it that QED breaks Lorentz invariance? So then I'm stopped. Okay. It can be generalized to non-abelian case. So I want to look at the uh, 
I want to look at the uh, connection field A and the correlation. Let's say consider the free case, and the two point function is this one. Okay? The uh, problem is illustrated already at the two point function, where D is the causal propagator. Okay? Now, if writing like this, this A is not a well defined operator on a Hilbert space because it, is, it has indefinite metric. It acts on an indefinite metric crime space, okay? which has all kinds of bad properties. We would like to uh, make sure that it acts on a Hilbert space. So the trick is to take a e dot a vector e, uh, so that e dot e is negative, so it is sp space like, and in my metric eta zero zero is plus one, and take this set of states which happens to be uni union or d set of spaces, uh, and for uh, and these people, Mundrier and Shaw and before them also, they define this inf what they call infra field phi. Which is is a lambda express e tau e lambda integrated. So I am contracting this a lambda with the space like direction and integrating it in the direction of this space like direction. And whatever I get, I write down. And this is this operator is well defined because you eliminated the the negative uh, negative matrix uh, modes by this e lambda. Okay. So under gauge transformation. This phi transforms because it is a Wilson line. It transforms phi changes by theta of x plus e tau minus theta of x. By the way, I heard, I learned very recently that this construction was used uh, Dirac certainly much before that. Stuckelberg appears to have used it okay, in some papers which I found uh, but Schroer quoting. Okay. Stuckelberg seems to have discussed this whole thing. Okay. So, what does this equation mean? It means that this exponential i creates a charge on sky in the direction e. Okay. So this is the, the limiting direction. In the limiting direction, you get this theta. So it creates a charge at infinity and also creates an anti-charge at x because of the second term. So if I look at this state here, where psi is, say, let's say, uh, some matter field at x, x and multiplied by uh, transforming by with charge e and multiplied by this object. This is invariant under local gauge transformations, but so is Gauss law invariant, but it has a charged blip in the sky at, in the direction e. Okay? So if you go to infinity, this is a charged blip at infinity. Okay? So it has created a charge at infinity. So there's a surface state which is sitting here. Uh, by the way, such surface state also occur in the horizon of the black hole coming again by the same mechanism. That I have checked, even though the, none of them involve gravity uh, metric. So I can easily check that it, because I'm using just one forms, uh, integration or one, one forms, the metrical issue is not there. Okay. So I can actually calculate this phi for the free case. And it is a, uh, it, it does this a, a mu, the creation, uh, standard creation or annihilation operator contracted with e mu. So it is, there's only space, spatial components and one checks that it, it doesn't require negative metric at all. Okay. It acts on an actual Hilbert space. Okay. Now, what I want to say is yeah, that if, uh, suppose now I make a Lorentz transformation on this phi. So when I do that Lorentz transformation, it will change x, but it will also change e. That is a reason for that is very simple. I go back. Yeah. I go back here. And you see that uh, when I make a Lorentz transformation in the standard way, it rotates lambda also, the index lambda. So the uh, change of the index lambda is carried over to E lambda. So E lambda is also changed. Okay. So the direction in which this uh, blip is happening at infinity changes. Okay. So the fact that the blip is happening at a different spot okay, uh, actually changes the super selection sector. So, uh, uh, what you the excitation you are finding at infinity, namely the uh, if you apply Gauss law, the test function at Gauss law in one case will be look uh, evaluated at e inf at infinity. In the second case, at lambda times e. So they have they can, you can choose a test function with different values. So you are changing the super selection sector. So accordingly, the Lorentz group is spontaneously broken. Okay, uh, this is what happens in QED, and I'm finished. Okay. And one can explicitly show in, uh, say, the free field case that a state like this and a state like this. Okay? So I have written down 
give different values for sky generators. Okay. Okay. So uh, one can actually do the calculation using the phi I gave and they are orthogonal as we expect. Okay. No local observable can change from one year to the other. They are simply orthogonal. But E has a, a whole continuous infinity of values. So you have a continuous infinity of supercellular sectors and they are all orthogonal. And if you try to take a direct integral over E, which you can do, then you are getting immediately a, a very uh, a highly non plus well, at least I don't know how to handle this non separable Hilbert phases. That's what you end up with. Okay? So, this is the proof, if you like, uh, to prove that QED breaks Lorentz invariance can be uh, elaborated in many ways. Uh, the, uh, the reason is that the infrared cloud uh, in the direction E and the infrared cloud at the direction E prime are two different infrared clouds. So, the infrared effects have a powerful impact on what is happening with Lorentz group. Let me say that uh, where are these, how do I see this in QED? Let me remind you that the spontaneous symmetry breakdown and Higgs mass again is coming because of the uh, states in the two cases being very different. Okay? The algebra observables in two cases are exactly the same, but the states we are using, one uh, gives zero mass for the Higgs boson, and the other gives a finite mass. You implement the second by choosing a Lagrangian which defines a state on the algebra. So it is the change of the state that is causing infrared effects. Okay? That's also what is causing spontaneous symmetry breakdown, ferromagnetism, all kinds of things. So one cannot talk about these two things separately, and one cannot talk, I think, uh, it, uh, one should be very careful in talking about these two things uh, uh, classically without the like, conv convincing argument that they won't give trouble. I think I'll stop because of um, I have. I don't want to, yeah, I don't want to keep going. I'll stop here. Questions? Observations, comments? Yes. Hello, uh, short question. When uh, tau and x hat doesn't square to one, what, what will happen? Then mm, uh, tau and x hat, then it won't be how it, you can do that. Then you will find uh, not winding, you won't get winding number one. You'll get something else. But similar effects again will happen. If, uh, this is the sky group that, so the, in the sky group that Sachin and I considered, the test function at infinity need not be exponentiated, need not give. Uh, constant value on the two sphere can change. Okay? Uh, in fact, it must change for many purposes. For example, in the gravity case, it has to change to implement the the Arnoid basal emission EDM generators. You must change the test. The Witten's construction of the EDM generators, the test uh, spinner, Witten's spinners do change at infinity. Okay? He considers some elliptic operator and they do change. So then you will get another super selection sector okay, and it will have its own properties. So every super selection sector is going to give its own particular properties. Uh, uh, for the infrared case, uh, it is not evident how to access them experimentally. Okay. But there are cases where you can access them in a dramatic way. For example, the Higgs mass. Higgs mass is entirely due to this choice of state. Okay. So it can be, so I think one is a or maybe in the, in the electric dipole moment, maybe you can access. Okay. There may be other effects also. Okay. So, yes, your, it's, a good, it's a good, correct question. Adela? Probably more of a comment. Hmm? Your, uh, this thing that was not in Dublin, the last one about the fact that you can have this tau times x hmm. that tau can be in any direction. Mm -hmm. I think that when you have rotations around an axis in space time, then we know what an axis is. Then spin, of course, is being an internal degree of freedom. In principle, we wouldn't know where the axes are, except that they couple with the magnetic field in a certain way. Therefore, I know what it, does, what it means to have 
axis around Z. But here you don't have an, an action which couples. So you have actually a freedom of. Uh, yes. But now it's very suggestive the fact that you connect it with the theta vacuum, and that uh, hmm. probably should be understood hmm. better. It's what happens. You're quite right that, well, that is another issue. There is no experiment whatsoever you can do on a non abelian system without an external, without, you can't do it because it's non abelian. So there are inner automorphisms. So if I say measure third axis, what do I mean by third axis? The system doesn't know third axis, it can be there, there. So you need some uh, extraction of an abelian subalgebra to see this. And this has been known for some time. And we also wrote a paper on this. And the abelian subalgebra seems to emerge here from this phi, exponential i phi. They do generate an abelian subalgebra at infinity. Okay? They do, and it is a non separable space. So uh, uh, this is not bad. For example, if you take the algebra of functions on a line and uh, do a GNS construction on it, the, 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 for each value of x on the line, you have a reducible representation by the evaluation map. You take the Dirichlet integral for the algebra of functions on a line, which is a commutative algebra, you get a non separable space. Okay? There is a momentum which changes the whole thing into separable space. So, this is not bad. So, my conjecture is that experimental observations require these super selection sectors at infinity. But uh, I'm not sure. I mean, we are. Uh, we are discussing it every other day. Hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, we've uh, talked about this off and on, but uh, have you any ideas on how to do this discussion at null infinity? Null infinity. Instead hmm. of spatial infinity. Hmm. Because uh, uh, that is an yes. important way. That yes. Is a very I, important I question. So I was starting to start looking at null, null infinity, but the uh, so the Escott field I wrote down, which I wrote down uh, following uh, the people uh, dealing with uh, fields localized on uh, cones, which is necessary in the case of well, field localized on cones emerge first because of the uh, massless representations of the Lorentz Poincare group corresponding to zero mass and uh, infinite helicity. Yeah. So there's an infinite dimensional representation of the rotation group in the helicity state, where the helicities keep going from minus infinity to plus infinity. This is in the Wigner classification. They are perfectly good fields. Energy is positive, everything is positive. But for a long time, nobody knew how to write a quantum field. Okay? Uh, local quantum fields, it was proved by Ingvarsson, do not exist. Okay? Then it was proved by that group, uh, uh, Bush, Rover, and so on. Okay? That this uh, what is it, field localized on cones do exist. They wrote it down and developed a quantum theory on it. And then it merged with standard quantum field theory. And now it has reappeared in gauge theory. Okay? This is what has happened. Okay? But the null infinity, I don't know how to handle because if I try to write this as, uh, axion uh, axial gauge, I had to go in the time like direction. Okay? Uh, the a dot dl will go from some spatial point uh, in the time like direction to null sky plus. If it is time like, then the corresponding field I am writing down will be will not act on a Hilbert space, it will have negative matrix space. Then I don't know. I mean, you can say what you like, but. It is not a, you have to eliminate those negative metric spaces, negative metric components. But if you start doing that, you have all this effects of uh, uh, quotienting the object, uh, BRST, uh, uh, whole thing, uh, BV, uh, all kinds of junk activity comes into play. One has to master them, and I don't, I am not master, I don't know how to handle them. So that is where, I, let me say, at this moment, I'm stopped there. I don't know how to write the analog of this construction of these people to null infinity because of the fact that the direction to go to null infinity is time-like. So since we are running a little bit late, there are other questions that can be postponed to the coffee okay. break. And uh, we thank Professor Balachandran again.
Next speaker is Patrizia Vitale from the University of Naples, who will speak about Jacobi, the Jacobi Sigma model. Uh, can we have your microphone? Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Uh, let me thank the organizers for inviting me here. So, uh, my talk will be about the Jacobi Sigma model, which is a generalization of the Poisson Sigma model. Uh, this is the outline of the talk, so I will give some short motivations, and uh, I will have to describe a little bit of Poisson Sigma model for those of you who are not familiar with it. Uh, then I will say something about uh, twisted Poisson Sigma models. And finally, I will introduce Jacobi uh, structures and uh, a Sigma model, which is based on these kind of structures. So uh, motivations first. As I said, it is a, a generalization of the Poisson Sigma model, uh, which is a topological tool dimensional field theory, which is important actually for many reasons. It was first introduced in 94 by Ikeda and uh, sorry, I misspelled the name of Schaller and Strobel, Strobel is here. <laughs> and it was introduced in relation with the two dimensional field theories with non-trivial target spaces like uh, gauge and gra gravity models, gauge and less domino with models. So the model is important and uh, still studied because it uh, provides actually a, a, um, a relation with deformation quantization and it is an alternative uh, way to, to uh, prove uh, the Concevich star product by using uh, field theory, quantum field theory techniques. This, this was uh, done in 99 by Catania and Felder. Being a, a topological, yeah? Sorry? Concevich himself. Yeah, the, uh, I mentioned this paper because it is the approach that I am using to uh, generalize it to the Jacobi. Okay, thank you. Uh, as I said, since, since it is a two uh, dimensional topological field theory, namely fields are maps from uh, two dimensional manifold to some target space, this target space pr pr provides interesting strings backgrounds. When uh, the source manifold has a boundary, then you have, a, since it is a, a constra constrained uh, model, it has a one dimensional dynamics on the boundary, which can be quantized. And finally, it possesses uh, generalizations, which are not all, non, non topological, dynamical actually by adding a metric tensor field on the target space. So what are Jacobi manifolds? They can be seen as an instance of twisted Poisson manifolds, namely the uh, skew symmetric tensor, which I will use on this uh, target space, does not, is not Poisson. 
it is almost Poisson. Uh, and then one can construct uh, sigma models on this kind of manifolds, which are interesting and relevant for the same reason as above. Sorry, I do not see the pointer. Top button. Okay. Uh, so since um, having a Poisson manifold uh, um, implies associativity for quantization, once you have this uh, twisted Poisson manifolds, you expect that the quantization that you get is non-associative. And uh, uh, the, the quantization of this kind of models is uh, interesting uh, as well. And one can look for deformation quantization. Um, I said that, that it is a kind of twisted, that the model that I will describe is a kind of twisted Poisson Sigma model, um, but the um, natural action that I will construct for this kind of manifold is not uh, the same as the one which is uh, generally introduced for twisted Poisson Sigma models. So we will see the, the difference between them. Uh, and then the same way as the field theory on, this, on Poisson manifolds can, I mean, yields a, a deformation quantization of the Poisson structure, one could look into this Jacobi sigma model as a way to look for deformation quantization of the structure. Uh, examples of uh, Jacobi manifolds you 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 know and uh, in odd dimensions they are contact manifolds in even dimensions you have locally conformal symplectic manifolds and these are the two main instances of jacobi manifolds i will say in detail what what are the structures okay so let me uh, shortly review what is a Poisson sigma model. It is a um, two-dimensional to topological field theory uh, with target space a, a manifold which is endowed with a Poisson tensor pi, capital pi. The action it is written here. The fields are the usual embedding map. This x going from a, a source face to the target. Eta is a one form on sigma, which is valued in the pullback of the cotangent bundle of the target space. Essentially, loosely speaking, it, it means that eta is a one form both on sigma and on m. Dx, the, dx is a one form on sigma, but it is valued in the pullback of the tangent bundle of m then i have i will use well actually i use the here the natural pairing between tangent and cotangent bundle in order to contract this in this indices in local coordinates maybe it is more transparent what are what are these objects so uh, this uh, me uh, goes from uh, one to two u zero is p u one is u hmm? So one can look for the equations of motion. One gets these two equations here. And uh, if one checks the consistency of the two, uh, one obtains that the two are consistent if pi is a Poisson tensor, namely if the scouted bracket of pi with itself is zero. If the boundary, if there is a boundary, we also need uh, boundary conditions and uh, uh, the boundary conditions amount to require eta to be zero on the, on the boundary. It has been shown that the model is invariant under uh, diffeomorphisms of sigma. And uh, 
well, well, if the only if the target space is symplectic, one can get rid of eta, which is somehow an auxiliary field. One can integrate out eta, and one gets this action here, where omega i j will be the omega will be the symplectic form in, in inverting the Poisson tensor there. And this is a kind of uh, this is a to topological action. This B field is actually the symplectic uh, to form that I that I have there. But I mean, one as I said can integrate out eta only if pi is uh, invertible. So uh, the Lagrangian one can be more explicit. The Lagrangian is here. So this Z and beta are the components of the one form eta. So derivative with respect to P, P component, U component, X dot and X prime are the analogous for the embedding map uh, X. And then from the expression of the Lagrangian, one sees immediately that X and Z are conjugate variables that uh, the theory has constraints. This is the uh, primary constraint. This is a se secondary constraint. This is actually the Hamiltonian, and it is itself a pure constraint. Cage invariance. Uh, so the, the model is diff invariant. Uh, the infinitesimal generators are the Hamiltonian vector fields, which I associate with the Hamiltonian by canonical Poisson brackets. They look like that. And uh, uh, one can check the Poisson algebra, well, the Lie algebra of mm -hmm. this object. And one finds that it closes um, on shell only if one allows for the uh, Parameters for 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 beta to be uh, not not only a function of u but also a function of the field. In which case, the algebra of uh, the Hamiltonian closes with respect to the this bracket here. It, this is a bracket a bracket among one forms, and this is a costul bracket introduced by Kostul in 85, I, uh, which is also known as the Gerstenab bracket. The whole algebra of forms then with this bracket is the battling Vilkovinsky algebra. So uh, this bracket here satisfies Jacobi identity if pi is a Poisson tensor. Hmm? The this pairing here is a natural pairing which we have already used between the tangent and the cotangent. So this is all all known. I am only reviewing it. Sorry. Then uh, since the algebra closes, we have a, a um, Lie algebra homomorphism. Uh, the Hamiltonian constraints are first class because their Poisson algebra closes. And then the, the Hamiltonian vector fields generate gauge, trans, gauge transformation. Hmm? Then we, uh, one considers the reduced phase space namely the, uh, what one obtains by taking the quotient of the constrained phase space with respect to the gauge group. And it uh, has been found, I think in this paper, Cataneo in 2001, that the reduced phase space is actually finite dimensional. Of twice the di dimension of the target space.
So what are these twisted Poisson brackets? So uh, actually I have been told about them by Peter Schuch, who is here, and uh, also about the connection with the Jacobi Sigma model that I am going to discuss. They, they are introduced as long as I know uh, in these papers by Milonas, Schupp and Sabo, and then by Ikeda and Strobel. Sorry? I cannot hear. Uh, okay, so what, what is an H-twisted Poisson structure? Hmm? Um, what happens is that you, ha you have this uh, skew, skew symmetric by vector field on your manifold M, but the Scouten bracket is not, is not zero. Remember that uh, phi is a two uh, is a by vector field. Then uh, the Scouten bracket with itself is a three vector field. So this expression here defines a three form, which is this H here. So H, let me say it loosely, is a kind of inverse of the three vector field that one gets uh, from this calculation here. So you you have a skew symmetric by vector field, which does not satisfy uh, Jacobi identity, scout and bracket uh, zero. So it is the H-twisted Poisson sigma model. It is a generalization of, of the Poisson sigma model, which would be only this part of the action here, by adding a West Domino with a like term. So N is a Three is a um, uh, is a three-dimensional manifold whose whose boundary is uh, sigma x star is the pullback of this three form on n. And now I, I am using the same symbol for x and the the, ex, the extended map, but now x uh, is an extended map from n to m then one can compute again the equations of motion, the, the dynamics, and one gets the, the same as before with this new term here. And consistency is assured by pi, pi and h satisfying this relation here. Sorry, I did the same as Ball. Okay, let me come now to the the, the main content of the, the talk, namely Jacobi uh, sigma models. So what are the Jacobi brackets, first of all? They were introduced by Lishnerovitz in 78, and I think also Kirillov a little bit early, earlier. They are skew uh, symmetric brackets on uh, the, the algebra of functions on, the, on a given manifold M. So now I have lambda, which indicates my bivector field in order not to confuse with the previous Poisson one. And I have an extra object, which is this vector field E, which is called the, the rib vector field. So the bracket is defined in this way. If it were, if lambda were Poisson, I would only have this contribution here. Instead, I, I have these two extra terms. So EG is the lead derivative of the function G along the rib vector field. You see that the bracket is not uh, described in terms of, of a uh, bivector field, hmm? of a b okay, bivector bi field. It is a, a, a bidifferential operator, but not a bivector field. And uh, as I said, lambda now does not satisfy the scout and bracket being zero. And it is here that this rib vector field appears. 
So of course, if E is zero, you are back with the Poisson structure. And uh, uh, the lead derivative of the by vector field la lambda with the rib vector field has to be zero. So this bracket uh, enjoys Jacobi identity, the whole thing. But Leibniz rule is violated by this contribution here. We know two main classes. There are two main cl classes of Jacobi manifolds, which are contact manifolds and uh, um, locally conformally symplectic. I will show you how to obtain the structures lambda and E by the defining structures of this kind of manifolds. So to 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 make a contact with uh, what I was saying earlier, namely that this is an instance of uh, age twisted Poisson brackets. Well, simply here the the um, three vector field which you obtain by com by computing the Scouten bracket is simply two e wedge lambda. I mean the um, I can take I can uh, find the three form which corresponds to the violation of the Scouten bracket here. I mean this. No, so uh, from this computation here, you you get a three vector, and then okay, and then the, it defines H, hmm? this ex this expression. So now I do have the th three vector, and I can let's say invert for 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 H. I can show it. If, sorry. Uh, right. Um, okay, but in the in the in the two cases, L LCS and uh, contact, I will show you H. Okay. Uh, so, so you are, you you have to distinguish between the two tensor lambda and the whole the whole the whole bracket. So let's say when you are sorry when you are with Jacobi the twisted object is this lambda lambda is a twisted object right like here if you stop here then so the Jacobi bracket, namely this whole thing, does not satisfy Leibniz, but it that satisfies Jacobi. What I am saying is that, is that lambda is a, a kind of twisted Poisson. Hmm? Okay. So what are uh, what are the two main examples of contact manifolds that uh, I want to talk about. So in, in even dimensions, um, these are called locally conformally symplectic because they are described in terms of a two form which is non-degenerate, but not symplectic. It can be, uh, I mean, it is related to a symplectic form C, 
locally by this factor, this conformal factor e to the minus s. So c is symplectic, omega is, is not. Hmm? But it is non-degenerate. And then, uh, so it, ha it has this, this property. So it is not closed. The omega is non-zero. This alpha, if you compute it from this ex expression here, alpha is locally df. So globally, conformally symplectic manifolds are the same thing. The only difference being that f will be defined on the whole manifold. So what are lambda and e for locally conformally symplectic manifolds? They are defined in terms of the of uh, the structures omega and a. So you, you define the rib vector field in this way, namely implicitly, the, the con contraction of E with the two form omega will give you this one form alpha. And you define lambda the, by, by vector field by saying that uh, uh, the contraction of this vector field for each one form gamma, you get a vector field here, the contraction of this with the two form omega should give you back lambda. So loosely speaking, let me say that E is somehow the inverse of alpha and uh, lambda is somehow the inverse of the two form omega. What about contact uh, manifolds? Well, contact manifolds are uh, odd dimensional. They, have, they are defined in terms of a contact one form this theta and uh, uh, the volume form on this two n plus one dimensional space is also defined in terms of theta in this way. Uh, okay, so nice examples. For example, you can think of the, the group manifold of three dimensional semi-simple Lie groups. So then you can take as a contact one form, uh, one of the globally defined uh, left invariant or right invariant forms. And then the volume is exactly theta wedge d theta. And you get uh, an example. In this case, the global structure lambda e is fixed by uh, these two conditions here. So this, this will give me e which again somehow is related to theta, is a kind of an inverse of theta. And this will give me a lambda, which is instead related with the d theta to the end. It, in three dimensions, uh, this, these equations here simplify and you get uh, um, the expressions that I have here. So once I have defined uh, what a Jacobi manifold is. Let me mention that uh, there is this pr procedure which is called the Poissonization, which allows uh, us to go from a Jacobi manifold to a Poisson manifold, which is higher dimensional simply by um, passing from the Jacobi bracket to this object here, which is a, a true Poisson uh, tensor. It is a homogeneous actually, and it is actually a one parameter family, tau being the parameter. So this Poissonization is useful because um, gives a hint, allows for, for a definition of Hamiltonian vector fields for Jacobi manifold. So what do we do? We define Hamiltonian vector fields on the Poisson manifold M times R, and then pro project down to the M to, to our uh, Jacobi manifold M. If one does this procedure explicitly, one gets this, this, this expression here. So this would be the usual uh, Hamiltonian vector field that I get with the Poisson structure. And, that, and they have this extra term here. 
So this map uh, from functions on M onto vector fields on M is a homomorphism of the algebras. Here I, I have the Jacobi bracket. This is the standard Lie bracket. So I do have a Hamiltonian vector field. So finally, what is the natural model that we, we have proposed on this uh, um, Jacobi manifold? It is the, uh, the standard Poisson sigma model supplied with this extra term here. So the difference being that we have, we have an extra field, lambda, not only eta, but also lambda, which is needed because we have this rib vector field to, to pair. Hmm? Uh, what are more in, more in detail the, the geometric nature of this field? So X, again, is the, is the, is the embedding map. Eta lambda is now, uh, these are one, one forms which are valued in the pullback, not anymore of the cotangent bundle of M, but of this, of this uh, one jet bundle of real functions on M. So this, this, uh, the sections of, of, of this jet bundle are essentially, one can look, look at them as uh, they, they are ice, isomorphic to the algebra one form of this form actually, which are a sub algebra of the one form forms of the extended manifold. Hmm? So the nice thing is that uh, this algebra, this sub algebra is closed with respect to the cost tool bracket on the big manifold here. So the, impo the important difference, as I already said, with, with respect to the Poisson sig sigma model is, is the existence, is the necessity of this new auxil auxiliary field lambda. So this lambda is, is a one form on, on the source manifold, the, the same as eta, but it is a scalar on the Jacobi manifold. And, and it is needed because J is not a bivector field. So I need to, pair this rib vector fit with it. Okay, so uh, what happens for this model? So we, we studied it in the Hamiltonian approach. Uh, so in lo local coordinates, same as before, dx, eta, and lambda acquire this form. So beta, uh, beta and zeta, they, ha they have an extra index on the manifold uh, M, whereas lambda T and lambda U are scalar. So if you write the Lagrangian explicitly, this part uh, would be the Poisson sigma model, but then I, I, I have these two extra terms which, which involve the rib vector field. The boundary, Conditions now uh, pose uh, a constraint on the field beta, but no boundary condition for this extra field lambda. This is now the, the Hamiltonian. This will be again a constrained uh, system. Z and uh, beta and, and X are again conjugate variables uh, as we can see from the Lagrangian, but now we have, we, we have more primary constraints and we have more secondary constraints. Hmm? These two are new. So we did the, the Dirac analysis of constraints. And what we find is that now we have second class constraints that we have to get rid of. Um, and these are the second class constraints. Well, this is just a technical comment, not useful for the moment. All other constraints are first class. So a, com a combination of the other constraints with the, of the first class will give again gauge transformation. So gauge transformations will look like this expression here. 
Uh, yeah, this is, I mean, uh, we chose, uh, we chose the, um, to adapt the coordinates in such a way that the rib vector field has only components on the last, on the coordinate XM. It's just a technical simplification, but it doesn't, uh, it's not that important. Hmm? This is this is why I I have n here because I chose e in that way. Okay, so these are this is, these are the the gauge um, transformations now, and uh, we compute their uh, Poisson algebra, their the brackets. And what happens? It happens the same thing as for the Poisson sigma model, namely the algebra will only close on shell. So in order to obtain that the algebra be closed off shell, we again have to allow for the gauge parameters to be functions of the fields. Namely, we want to use a, a kind of cost tool of generalization of the cost tool bracket for uh, Jacobi manifold. So we computed the Poisson bracket. It is again a combination of the same constraints as before with these coefficients. And it is possible to rearrange this Poisson bracket in this simple, nice form with now the bracket, what was before the hostile bracket, had generalization for Jacobi, Jacobi manifold, which uh, we found in these two papers by Kerbrat in 93 and Weizmann in the 2000. Actually, um, this bracket can be seen to come from the cost two bracket on the higher dimensional space M times R. Hmm? So here I say a little bit uh, how the bracket is performance. This part, this part in blue is exactly the cost to bracket. And these are the new, this is the new contribution. And this is the, the function part of the, of the, of the bracket. So uh, now the Jacobi identity for the algebra of constraints, no, sorry, for the um, bracket of forms holds provided the manifold is Jacobi, hmm? namely provided lambda and E are uh, the defining elements of a Jac Jacobi bracket. So this is a nice uh, generalization, I think, of the situation that we have seen for the Poisson phase. Results. So results, there are, um, we have seen that differently from the Poisson Sigma model, we also have second class constraints. We managed to uh, eliminate them. And again, first class will generate gauge tran transformations um, with, uh, this generalization of the cost to bracket for gauge parameters. So these are uh, first uh, results that we have obtained. Namely, we have uh, studied the, the reduced uh, phase space. We have seen that it is again finite dimensional, but the dimensions is uh, reduced by two due to the fact that we have uh, second class constraints. In this case, the auxiliary fields may be integrated out always. We do not need the uh, invertibility. This is something uh, nice. Namely, you can obtain an action solely in terms of the embedding uh, maps, the, the embedding fields. Then we, ha we have studied the dynamical extension of the model in the same uh, spirit as what is done for the Poisson sigma model by adding namely a metric field on the target space. This would be something that uh, um, we would like to do, namely 
quantization along the lines of H twisted Poisson structures. Uh, well, uh, we spoke with Peter Schuf a little bit about how to perform this, but we haven't have advanced too much for the, the moment. Analyze the geometry of the, the reduced phase space. This is something that we are doing. And uh, model building for specific target phase. So, this is something that we have done, done for simple examples, uh, three-dimensional contact manifolds and uh, uh, four-dimensional locally conformal symplectic manifolds. And I think uh, I am done. Uh, this work was done in collaboration with Francesco Bascote and Franco Petella, who is here. And it's based on these papers, which are uh, on their on their side. Thank you. Okay. Some questions? Yes, Professor yes. Alexander. This one get a representation of these algebraic structures on a Hilbert space. So that one can make actual measurements. We haven't done. It. Huh? We have. We haven't looked at, at this representation. No. So because the contact manifolds, the problem is is in three odd dimensions. Mm -hmm. So if you try to write it on a Hilbert space, you get then you don't know how to use it. Kim. So the issue I'm asking is: this is a quantum theory. No, as problem. I said, quantization we would like to do, but we but have you get a Hilbert space. For, for for the moment, this classical, but, huh? No, but uh, you, it's a contact manifold. Underlying it is a contact manifold. Yeah, but I would like to quantize it by recognizing it as a Jacobi manifold. Hmm? But we didn't we didn't do it well. Hmm? Quant quantization along the, the lines of H twisted Poisson structures. I, I didn't stress actually, maybe I should, sorry, Bal, that the action is different from the H-twisted action. This one we tried, there's no way of putting it in the in the form of the H. The although we do have H, sorry, in this form here. So we, ha we have a dif different action. This is a little bit, and, uh, direction of the question of uh, trouble about this H. We do have it for the two structures. Uh, sorry. These two here. So we are able to write H in terms of omega and alpha, or in terms of this theta, d theta, but then the action is different. But I don't know how to answer to your question because we didn't Maybe you have that answered quantization. It, but I want to see operators acting on a Hilbert space. But we didn't quantize the model. So, so this is a classical model. This is the classical, yes. That is my question. You were there. Yeah. That was my question. Yeah. Okay. There's a question over there. Uh, so the, the original Poisson sigma model helps mm -hmm. you to define some infinity morphism of which uh, deformation quantization is a particular case. And uh, for Jack for Jacobi sigma model, what is the analog if it's known? Uh, so this model has has been introduced. Why did we write the, the the action in that form? Well, because the inspiration came from. This action. The inspiration came from the fact that you, you can uh, poissonize the manifold. So you can go one dimension higher. As I said, you can look at M times R, and then your Jacobi bracket be becomes a Poisson bracket this way. 
the data uh, this 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 way here sorry i do not see this way and then on the manifold m times r you do have a poisson sigma model then you can try to re to re reduce it to the jacobi manifold you obtain something like the action i wrote So if you like, you can interpret this action as what you get when you go from a Poisson sigma model on the space M times R to the Jacobi manifold M. There are little differences because if you directly start from this action, you do not get any boundary condition for this field lambda. Whereas if you start from a Poisson manifold, uh, then you get boundary conditions as well for lambda, but the, the, the action looks like uh, the same actually. So I don't know if I answered your question. The way we found it was by reduction. Okay, maybe one last question. Maybe I missed it, and maybe it just does not make my, my sense. So what would happen if you take this deformed model and just go ahead along just lines Cataneo further and try to produce a star? Yeah, this we this we would like to do. We didn't do it. Okay. It would be a quantization of the, no, the formation the quantization point. of the Jacobi map. Uh, do you expect kind of a twisted star due to the twist? I mean, but that will be definitely not kind of greenfield twist. It will be different twist. I mean, but I don't. I don't. I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. Hmm? Okay. Thanks. If no other questions. Our ask, then uh, we thank Patricia Vitale again. Yeah. And we reconvene at 6.30 after the coffee break. Ah. Leonardo, non mi si voglio Ah, no, ho fatto. Ok. Ah, Quando dal... Non ho fatto. Sì,